I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Taylor Sparks. I'm here at the University of Utah in the Material Science and Engineering Department, and I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Andrew Falkowski. Andrew, how you doing, man? Doing well. It was cooling down for a little bit. I was really enjoying the weather, went out, did some night photography, did some hikes, but now it's hot again. So degrees. Hopefully, hopefully we get a nice downward trend again. I hope this is an outlier in our in our temperature, but based on how the rest of the summer has gone, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think I'm going to get what I want. Yeah. Well, we have a treat for you today. As you know, we rotate between a variety of different topics on this show. We got your new materials. We've got new processing. Uh, you know, we talk about the history of known materials. We talk about commercialization. And today we're going to talk a little bit about commercialization, but we're also going to talk about characterization, right? And there is a really cool characterization technique, which we're going to cover. Uh, and this episode is sponsored by the people that came up with this technique. This is Correlated Solutions, Inc. They reached out to us and told us about the technique. And it's one that I'd heard of before. You know, when I was early in my career as a professor, I was teaming up with this guy and we were proposing to look at these nuclear fuel materials. And he wanted to monitor the strain in a bunch of ceramic grains, so small, you know, a few microns, with a camera like 10 feet away. And I was like, what? Is this a joke? Are you messing with me? Because I'm thinking microscopes or something. No, like the idea is a camera can actually monitor strain. If that sounds crazy to you, then just keep listening because this is a cool episode. Yeah, usually when we think about characterizing material and, and how it's going to respond to some sort of stress, we're either going to think about, okay, we're going to break it, get our stress strain curve, and then look at it under an SCM and then try to piece together exactly what happened. But if you ever looked at a stress strain curve, you realize that it really doesn't tell the whole picture. You could have some crazy cracks that are growing in your material, and the stress strain curve is really going to give you the yield point and maybe some other behavior uh, beyond that, like the ultimate strength. And when you're looking under the SEM, I can't be the only one where you look at some <laughs> sort of complex failure, and you can try to deduce what exactly happened, but there's no substitute for having real quantified data. And I think digital image correlation, what correlated solution cells is a fantastic method to go even deeper and understand materials in a better way. Yeah. So we're excited to bring you this episode. Like I said, very powerful technique and even better. We've got the inventor of the tech national member of the national Academy of engineering. Very, very cool guy invented it, came up with the company tune in. This is Dr. Sutton from correlated solutions, Inc. Okay, so welcome Dr. Sutton from Correlated Solutions Incorporated. We're so excited to have you on here. Uh, as I understand it, you're one of the founders of this technique. So who better to explain how this works than the person who came up with it? Uh, if you don't mind, could you give a brief introduction to yourself? For me, my background is I uh, was born in Illinois, went to get my PhD at the University of Illinois, joined the faculty at the University of South Carolina in 1982. And when I joined the faculty there, is when we began developing the technology called digital image correlation. Um, and I've been here my whole career. Uh, first, I'm the first faculty member in the state of South Carolina ever to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering uh, for the United States um, based on the work that was done in the state. So it, it, it all was driven by image correlation technology. Um, the work that we did in those days, in the, in the early 80s, uh, formed the foundation for the development uh, that later became what is the underpinnings of the Correlated Solutions Incorporated technology. So that's a, a brief background. That's fantastic. Yeah, would you like to give maybe a brief just overview, just quick general summary of how the technique works and kind of what you're looking for when you're using the technique? Well, the technique works as follows. Uh, you take images of an object, uh, from two separate cameras, just like your eyes. When it moves, uh, you can track it. And if you have features in each image that you can see uh, during the motion, the image locations can be converted into the three-dimensional positions of the feature 
at each time you acquire an image. By doing this for tens of thousands of separate points or features in the images, the motion of the entire object can be reconstructed. Uh, by analogy, with our eyes, we see a field of view, we watch what happens in it, we in our, our, our mind is the equivalent today of the computer, in our mind working with our eyes constructs images in three dimensions of what's there. It's not quite as quantitatively accurate as what we get with image correlation because the computer is very precise in the way it does it, but it does it in essentially the same way as you do with your eyes. Fantastic. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you usually apply some sort of pattern to the, the object to, to impart these features upon it. Now, are these just an array of maybe like a dot matrix or is it something a little more special? It could be a dot matrix. You could do that. Um, the, the only dis disadvantage to a dot matrix is that the pattern looks exactly the same everywhere. A little bit so of randomness might be better. Yeah, a random pattern is a little easier. You don't have to worry about where you start. If you start in a certain location in a random pattern, there's only one that looks like it anywhere nearby. So you can track everything around it independently. You don't have to worry about, well, did I get the same one gotcha. again and I'm seeing the same set of dots. Can I ask, like, how did this get discovered? What what was the background behind you first coming up with the the groundwork for this technique? Yeah, well... You got to go back a way, <laughs> a long way. Uh, the underpinnings of all this date back to Leonardo da Vinci in the 1400s. He was the first person with the camera obscura to determine how your eyes are seeing things in perspective. Further away, they look smaller, near, they look larger. He figured that out and developed basic ideas. Those ideas over the centuries stayed more or less the same until World War I. Between between 1850 and 1920, there were some theoretical works being done in Germany and other areas of Europe, but the real push occurred during World War I when planes who had only been recently developed were flying over battlefields and they took images, photographs. And they realized if they took two consecutive images at different times as they're moving across the battlefield, they can compare them and find out exactly where troops were. And so they use that as a driver for developing further technology. Oh, that is so cool. And, and over time, those photographs became the foundations for the first person to ever do image correlation with photographs. And his name was Gilbert Hofbrand. Um, he passed away uh, maybe 15 years ago. But when, when he initially did it in the 1950s, unfortunately, the scanners they had available were not very good. And so he had a lot of trouble converting photographs into a digital form that he then tried to correlate in a, in a computer. Computers were very poor at that time. Uh, the technology to scan them was not very good, <laughs> uh, but he was the first to attempt it. So from that time, the next driver from the 50s, when he first started doing that, the first, next driver was NASA. And NASA was trying to go to the moon. And we all know that they got there in 1969, but between 1960, when President Kennedy said, we will go to the moon until they actually went, there was a massive push for imaging. They developed laboratories. And the most famous is the Vision Research Lab at Stanford. Um, Sobel, a very famous person in optics, was one of the drivers for digital image technology. He pushed it. He developed a lot of the basic science and technology underpinning the connections between images and real world motion. So when, when we came around, it, when I came around and, and started doing this in the early 1980s, there was a lot of foundation already there. But what we did was we asked the question, we don't want to just watch how things move in, in general. We want to watch how they stretch, yeah. how they deform. Well, that's a different animal. It requires much more accurate resolution of the images. It requires you to do things that had not been done before. And the, and the precision that we get now is the key to the technology. If you can imagine trying to develop something that stretches, it can measure stretch of a, a few microns of motion, uh, then that's what we were trying to do. And early on, it was difficult with the technology in the 80s not being very good. 
but over time, the technology advanced, the theory became clear how to do it. Um, developments were made uh, locally within the University of South Carolina uh, to show us how to improve the accuracy of the imaging technology and then improve the accuracy of the measurements from the images. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's not just that we needed higher resolution cameras per se, or, you know, better, you know, pixelation of these things. But what about the math underlying, you know, tracking the movement of objects and that has that changed as well quite a bit? Not, not a lot. That, that, that goes back to Da Vinci. That stuff is solid. They, it, we, we use what, what is known today as a pinhole camera model. That's the typical one used. People have modified it a bit to account for distortions, higher order effects in optics. But the, do the dominant one is the pinhole camera and you correct the images. It's not perfect. So you have to have correction functions to distort the images to match what's really there because the perspective model works well. If you have a really good lenses, like a hundred millimeter, 150 millimeter lens, looking at something several meters away, uh, there, there's not much distortion in those. Yeah. The images you get are, are closely approximated by the pinhole camera model. If you get uh, something that's close to you with a wide angle lens, the edges of the lens are pretty distorted. Yeah, there's so a you have there's a well-known YouTuber who makes uh he likes to make crazy gadgets and he made a pool table with an automatic pool shooter and it was a similar technique. He had four cameras looking on it and the the image distortion was actually the hardest challenge for him to solve. Not the robotics of the pool cue that actually shot the shot or anything or the algorithm coming up with what yeah. shot to take. It was just making sure you had an undistorted field of vision was was his biggest challenge. Yeah, and if that's yep. the case, I I do a lot of photography myself. Um, as you adopt this, this, this method to different cameras, do you have to then just essentially write a new corrective function if you ever change cameras, right? Well, you, you would if, if you really go to, this, to weird cameras, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of cameras that people want to use in, in imaging for solid mechanics, the, the deformations of objects, structures, they're the standard lenses, the Nikons, the Canons, uh, those kinds of lenses, they're fairly standard, they're not highly unusual we know how they deform we know how they distort the image deform the image mm -hmm. distorted and those functions are exist they, they were developed um you know in the in the 1850s and 1860s people saw how these lenses distorted the image they developed the functions um we have implemented those functions in our software uh, in vic 3d and vic 2d software to correct for that uh, so if you get something out of that norm then we do have uh, uh, a patented technology that actually will allow us to go beyond that. It's based on uh, small shifts in the image and watching how the subsets deform, warp, because if it just translated, it shouldn't warp at all. It should just be moved straight. All of them should move exactly the same amount. But when it doesn't do that, then you can determine exactly how far it moved and you can correct it. So that, but that, that was not originally uh, useful because we didn't go to weird, systems, right. unusual systems. Uh, microscopes are particularly compl uh, com complicated. Microscopes oftentimes have very sophisticated objects to try to magnify things up, and they are oftentimes very distorted. And as a result, that's where we developed the patented technology to correct the microscope in images. But of course, it can work on any images. So it, it's generally applicable. You don't normally use it because it takes more effort to, to, to translate the object and to correct it. Um, I did find in the 1990s, uh, lo and behold, um, JPL, Jet Propulsional, have actually used a similar approach to correct every pixel in the cameras they sent on some of the lunar missions. That is so cool. Uh, yeah, those cameras were pretty special. Um, they're these really they awesome were. Hasselblad uh, film cameras. Oh, yeah. But the funny thing is, is after they took the photos, they ended up just ditching the cameras on the moon and took the film. Is so there right? are these really expensive cameras just <laughs> sitting on the moon. And a lot of people oh, in the Lord. film photography community are just <sighs> salivating at the chance to maybe fly up there and get some of these things. So cool. Like $30,000 cameras. They're beautiful. Jesus. But lenses are one Jump. thing, correcting for those distortions, but how about the sensors on the cameras themselves? Are you impacted by the resolution limit on the sensors that you're using, or are there techniques to try to go maybe sub-pixel resolution? Oh, we could spend a whole day on this. Um, the, the, the major improvement in camera technology went from the original um, film analog scanning cameras 
from the 1980s, 60s, 70s, 80s, to the solid state, square, generally square, sometimes four by three pixel, fixed pixel area cameras that digitize on board the photons that strike the sensor and store it. So you don't have any scanning. Whatever hits it, it immediately grabs it and stores it. That was the major improvement, in my personal opinion, in camera technology for accurate representation of deformations in bodies. Once that happened, then you just get more and more of them. They got better and better uh, technology to slice up the little silicon chips into fall, finer and finer pieces. Uh, today, a typical camera has a 3.5 micron by 3.5 micron pixel. That's a typical one. Um, and you can get up to 30 million. Okay, so the, 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 the scale of what they've got today is far better than they ever had before. Um, you are limited to some extent by that array. If, if you want to think about, there's two types of resolution in cameras uh, for DIC. There's spatial resolution and there's measurement resolution. Spatial resolution is what you're talking about. When you talk about pixels, suppose I have a one meter by one meter object and I have a thousand by a thousand array of pixels that sense that take an image of that one meter by one meter area. Then each pixel takes the average light coming from a one millimeter by one millimeter area. Gotcha. What happens inside of that, you don't know. That's your spatial resolution limit. Beyond the one millimeter, if you want to know what goes on in 0.1 by 0.1 millimeter areas, er, millimeter squared areas, you have to get a different camera because you're not going to get that no matter what you do, because it's going to blur it out among all the other 0.1 by 0.1 millimeter areas within that one meter, millimeter by one millimeter uh, sample. Um, so th that controls the spatial resolution you can get on the objects of what's going on. Measurement resolution is the one that deals with the sub-pixel resolution you're talking about. When you move something and you have the pixel ray watching you, it may move a sub-pixel amount. And for many years, people thought that there was a, a limit on the accuracy of the digital image correlation method because it's sub-pixel. It's between your samples. But, but you guys also have heard of 16x recordings where you go in and you do i'm, I'm going to sample it 16 16 times in in a fixed uh, time i'm going to sample it 32 times 64 times 64x 128x well why do they do that because they do a better job of, of resolving the, the the actual pattern in the music for example you can record it more accurately and do a better job of getting the higher frequencies well the same idea holds in digital image correlation. If you want to pick up small changes in what in, in the motion, then you can do that by accurate interpolation of the original pattern. Not just a set of digital in, discrete one pixel apart data points, but you interpolate that over the entire field to get a continuous function representing everything. Well, it, it, it's interpolating between the individual pixels. And um, fortunately, uh, Dr. Schreier, who's the CEO here at uh, Correlated Solutions, um, was, the, was the first person to identify exactly why it helps. Uh, he did that in 2000 in a paper that he published uh, that became a, a foundation piece of work for the, for the technology. He showed that not only can you get a lot better than a one pixel motion, you can get a thousandth of a pixel. And for many years, nobody believed us. They said, no way you can get one thousandth of a pixel resolution in the motion. Well, it turns out if you do a really good job and you don't have any vibrations and you don't have any thermal noise, there, it's unlimited. So there's no lower limit. How do you prove that? Accurate. What's the experimental validation that convinced people that that was the truth? Well, we actually did it. Uh, there's a guy at the, there's a fellow at the University of Maryland, one of my former PhD students, one of my former master's students, got a PhD at Caltech. He did some experiments with a nano scale. He had something that could move the object nanometer. It's a piezo sensor that he amounted something to and he moved it nanometer resolution levels. And he took that and he moved it known amounts uh, with some slight variability, of course. And then he imaged that 
and with a high, high resolution camera. And then he tracked the motion and tried to show that image correlation, the, the limits on image correlation. And if you don't have, if you did it in a beautiful environment with the, with everything turned off and no vib minimal vibrations, you got less than one ten thousand of a pixel accuracy. Wow. So it was stunning to see it. And it re everybody then realized once Dr. Shire had done that and, and, and Dr. Brooke at, at uh, Caltech now at Maryland had done the baseline experiments that this was really true, that the technology could do things that people never really envisioned at the time. Yeah, you know, as you're describing this to me at 1,000th of, let's say, let's go back to your example, maybe it's a, a millimeter that you're sampling. I previously, when I was getting ready for this episode, I was thinking, well, how do they look at large areas under a microscope? Do they sample an image, then another one, and create a grid of SEM images? But what you're describing, you could almost do that at the macro scale and still get really quite small resolution if you're at a thousandth of a millimeter. Yeah. Uh, there's a, yeah, you can. Uh, you, one micron. If, if you have a millimeter by millimeter sample area uh, on, uh, in the object, you can get one micron resolution for the displacements. Incredible. A thousand times smaller. That's, that's entirely doable in, in the right kind of environment. Of course, if you got, if you're in a room where things are vibrating and, the, and you got the air conditioner on and things are shaking, it's not that good, but it, it's still going to be 0.01 pixels. Wow. It's not going to be 0 0.5. It's still going to be excellent. Uh, but it, 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 there are limits if you don't have a good environment to work in. Um, uh, getting back to your idea about high magnification and looking at areas, small areas to get high resolution in a big region, um, there's a fellow named uh, Professor Sehatolu at Illinois. Uh, I went to his lab about uh, 10 years ago, and he had a lab in the basement uh, where it's very stable, and he had a very nice environment. He, he, he was doing exactly what you just said. He had a, a, a piece of a metal that had grain structure in it, and he wanted to resolve the individual grains, and he wanted to look in a large area. So he had his camera on the stage. You take a picture, move over, take a picture, did a thousand of them. It just sat there for four or five hours wow. taking images. And he would load it up, go back and do it again. And he correlated the first one to this one, the second one to the second one, third one to the third one and so forth. He got incredible resolution in what was going on in the grain structure by doing exactly what you just said. It, it, it is time intensive because you're trying to do things that are on the edge but it does work. And if you have higher and higher resolution cameras, as you said, if we get to you know a million by a million uh, sensor array, then of course you don't even need to do that. You can just take one big image and do the whole thing. Wow, uh, that's amazing. There, there are also people that now sell cameras at 50 million pixels yeah. in, 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 in a sensor. So you can get very high resolution already. Uh, 7 million, you know, uh, is, is fairly standard today. When we first started, a uh, one megapixel was incredible. Yeah, and at some point, right, vibrations and other stuff is way, mu way more the, the big problem to deal with, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's why scanning under microscopes, for example, are on in, in isolation rooms with temperature control on uh, and embedded in concrete. Laminar flow, and, yeah, all yeah. that. Yeah, everything. That makes me have so, to think, uh, you know, recent cameras, they used to put uh, image stabilization in the lenses to try to reduce vibrations. But recently, the trend seems to have been towards actually uh, doing in-body image stabilization where the sensor itself can move in response. Oh, wow. But the advantage yeah. to that was to say, well, what if we did, uh, what if we, instead of just trying to just take a single image, if we can shift where the sensor is, you could essentially create a grid like you're talking about. Where oh, yeah. Instead of having By to move the, the camera, move the sensor itself. Uh, by just fractions of nanometers and you can it's called pixel shifting i have to imagine that could be a next step in this where rather than having to move the camera and worried about some sort of misalignment if you can move the sensor itself nanometers that's really interesting but the technique well, you're it, describing is fascinating usually when we think about really small information we tend to think that you know when we aggregate stuff we tend to lose that small amount of detail but it seems that from what you're saying the aggregate itself provides our insight into the the smaller finer details it can, yes, it really can, and, and those those fine details in motion that were that are they're absolutely critical to measuring strain. It, 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 strain is the change in length per unit length is one way to think of. It. So you have a one meter area, and you want to measure with one micro strain, 
then you've got to measure with an accuracy less than one micron. We can do that today because of the, the capability to interpolate the images and extract subpixel motion. Without that, you couldn't do it. The, the limit is on the order of 0.2, 0.25 pixels. So you're, 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 you're hundreds of times off from what you need to be able to get the accuracy you really have to have for strain analysis, which is critical in all of solid, in, in understanding how solids behave. So, so speaking of that, I'm curious, you know, you're not a material scientist, but I mean, this has tons of applications in materials research. Are you aware of some of the interesting case studies where it's been used? I know you guys published some, some work where you worked with NASA and a few other companies. What else comes to mind? Well, uh, a large, a large percentage of what goes on today is dealing with materials. Okay. The, 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 there's a, I, I, the number of these I can give you would, would waste the next two hours, but let me just give you a few. A friction stir wells. A friction stir well is a, is, is a well you guys may have already done a podcast on. It's a technology to, to, to put together two pieces of aluminum without melting them. When you do that, that zone around there becomes heterogeneous. It's not the same material as the stuff around it. And as you move from the weld out, you get different responses. Well, that area was an active area of research by Dr. Reynolds here at the University of South Carolina, and I worked with him, and DIC was critical to that. We could measure the deformations in the weld and in the nearby and show the differences that were occurring under control loading. Now, what happens so in a, a situation like that? What if new features are generated? Um, you know, we've been sort of assuming that the features are static and they're just moving, but what if they're coming and going? Well, that's tricky. Uh, for example, if you have a void that forms, you, you're loading it up and suddenly a hole forms. A bunch of dislocations get together and you form a hole and you see the hole. You have to exclude that because that no longer can be correlated, compared. There's nothing there before. So it's not useful from the previous stuff. If you want to track it from here on, you could start from there. But the history before that is now different. Right. So you'd have to find a way to connect those two together. Uh, but new features are like cracks suddenly pop up. In concrete, this is common. As you're loading something up in concrete, it gets into tension a little bit, it cracks. Well, we've done some work on that, and the, the cracks themselves are, are areas where you don't get data. You get it around the crack, everywhere the material stays together, and it's, it's coherently deforming with the rest of the structure, you can get data. But within the crack, you get nothing, because it's something that wasn't there before. In fact, it, there's no material there at all now. It's an empty void. So yeah, those kind of things can happen. Um, they, they do cause problems when you're trying to compare images to get data for the structure as a whole. Hmm. So in snooping around for this episode, I was looking at, you know, what's new and upcoming in this field. And I see all sorts of crazy versions of this. You've got, you know, they call it stereo color versions of DIC. What else is out there that's up and coming that you could talk about? The, from my perspective, the, the key foundation is already done. That we have a solid foundation in what this technology can do. We know what it's capable of uh, to a large extent. Now there's going to be incremental changes. What you're talking about is an incremental change. Uh, some of the early work in color was done uh, in France by Francois Hild and his group. Uh, others have done it in other places. Uh, and and it's, it's not a major jump in the technology. It's, it's a sidelight to me. What is important is what's happening now. And there are two phases going on. We have the, the, the global adoption phase. Uh, which is actively going on right now. People are doing that. And there's the integration phase. The integration phase is probably the most Im Im impelling to me. Um, what that means is models are, the found are, are what people are using today to speed up production of, of cars, structures, components, whatever. They model it on a computer. They get initial analysis of whether it's going to be okay or not. And then they iterate on that to get something that looks right. Once they get it right, they think, they then make it. Well, what's missing there is the ability to, at that stage, combine it with data. They, they kind of do it based on history. Well, this worked before. Well, what if I really modified this a lot and put something else in? How would that work? Well, you can do one experiment with that, acquire full field data with DIC, and then use that to determine whether your model is properly predicting what's there. That is called model validation. Mm. 
It is one of the largest areas of active work in the United States, in the world today. Uh, NASA, Sandia, uh, GM, Chrysler, uh, you name them, uh, all, all Grumman, Boeing, Airbus, all the companies are involved in this. They're using it to guide their design process. They're using it to guide their development process to speed it up. If they know what's going on and their models are predicting it, then they can expand their model base. They can jump into areas, well, let's add this on. We never even tried it before, but it worked for everything else. So let's add it on. We know it's working. Let's see what happens when we do. And that speeds up the whole process. So this integration phase has been uh, one of the most interesting to me. Uh, it's, it's remarkable what people are doing. The scale of this, the, what they're getting into now, NASA, for example, is getting into what I call the, the extreme environment phase. Uh, so, is, so is the military in other places, in other countries even. We're looking at, at, at attempting to go into space where, where, with uh, aircraft that are going to go at, at Mach 7, Mach 8, coming in, coming out, doing all sorts of crazy things in transonic uh, uh, flight. Well, to do that, you, you really got to understand what's going on in the materials. If you don't, the materials will fall apart. We already know that. So to do that, they're now developing programs to study material response in extreme environments, very high temperatures, 3000 centigrade. I mean, numbers that don't even, almost incredible. Um, pressures of 50 gigapascals, things that, that they get beyond norms that you can think about. They're doing that now. And one of the drivers for that is they have a technology that can measure what's going on in the entire structure. And they're using those together, the model being updated with the data to be sure that you're getting accurate predictions. So that's one phase. The global adoption phase is slower. Um, there are many industries that could utilize this uh, incredibly well, but they don't know much about it. And they're always hesitant to jump into things with new technology when they don't have a history of it. So the, the industrial adoption of this technology, the adoption by areas that don't use it very often or don't know much about it has, has progressed and it's starting to ramp up. Uh, if you think of the standard curve of adoption, there's a, a rapid rise and then it flattens out as everybody adopts it. We're way down here yet. We, we, we're just beginning to get into new industries, new areas. Civil engineering, they're just now beginning to use this. I can only imagine. Design and develop bridges. They're, they're now beginning to talk about monitoring bridges with image correlation technology. Why? Because it's a whole lot faster to do that by putting a camera out there and watching it than have a guy go out there occasionally and figure out what's going on. So it, it, it's happening, but it's, it's slower. Uh, I give you an example of an area where uh, a colleague of mine has been working at all things with uh, um, a Korean company and they've been uh, shipping components and the edges of the boxes, the big, con the big boxes of uh, 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 that they're shipping them in, uh, are, the, the corners are crushing and they're damaging um, the, the washing machine. And they're not happy about it. And they, they don't know what to do. They get this stuff back. They don't have any history. Uh, my comment to my colleague who's working with us is, why don't you tell him to do those tests with DIC? You can go in, take the boxes, push on the corner, and measure how it deforms and figure out the characteristics of it and modify it in real time and see how, how it improves. Uh, they never even thought about it. Uh, it. It's an anathema to that. They're, they're unclear on what they can get from it. And because they don't know the technology, it's slower to be adopted. It's happening but at a much slower pace. Yeah, another thing that comes to mind is there's a lot of remote infrastructure that we don't have time to actually go and test all that often, right? We have an yeah. idealized creep rate yeah. assuming certain temperatures, right? But if we could have a remote camera system monitoring this, giving yeah. live feedback of how it's creeping, how deformations are changing, that seems like a game changer for uh, monitoring decaying U.S. infrastructure, which is an ongoing problem. Yeah, well, we, we, we started a project here at Correlated Solutions with the university on drone technology. We're mounting DIC systems on drones. We're going to fly them under bridges. We're going to look in places like you just said you can't get to. We're going to take data, and we're going to measure what's going on. Got to get a pattern on there. I'm not going to argue that, but that can be done. Once we get a pattern, we can track the features. 
then we're going to be able to track what goes on in that structure over time, just like you just said. Uh, it's coming. It's already, there are companies that are already talking about doing this with a variety of different technologies. DIC is, is one of them um, to track it. Uh, the advantage of DIC is it's full field. I can tell you what's going on everywhere in the region that I'm seeing. Um, and hopefully over time, this technology will be used to improve, like you said, the, the resiliency, the durability of structures by finding out when there's a problem and yeah, going sure. and fixing it before it becomes catastrophic. So let me ask, are, are there classes of materials that are sort of better or worse suited for this technique? I mean, anything will strain, I suppose. And as long as you can see that strain happening, but. The DIC technology is material, in, yeah, it's material independent, time independent, and load independent. It doesn't matter what you do. It is environment independent. It can acquire data on, in any material. The, the only limitation to it, in my personal opinion, is it's better if you have 100 micro strain or greater. If you have really, really small strain, there are a few materials down in that low strain range. They're mostly ceramics and glass. Those are the two areas where very small strains can be important. Okay, but the general situation 99.99 percent .99 are not that and in those it's you can do it for any type of material it's not a problem composites are using it at nasa for very complicated composite materials multi-layered um, they're looking at it from the side and watching how the layers delaminate and the deformations they're watching how the fibers pull out and, and trying to understand how they can improve the durability of the composite by studying how the dic patterns change uh, as it stretches and deforms in ways they didn't anticipate. So it, it, metals is, it has been used for, you know, that's where we started. We started with metals in the 80s and it's, it's exploded in all these other areas. Uh, ceramics for, for, for uh, we, did, we did use it for a ceramic, that's a concrete. Uh, concrete, of course, there is a limit on it. If you get above 400 microstrain in tension, it cracks. Uh, it's a very weak material in tension. It's incredible yep. in, in compression, five, 10,000 microstrain, no problem. That's why we build bridges out of it that are heavily compressed. Um, but those materials have limitations that require great care in using DIC in the very small strain range. So that, that's the main limitation <laughs> in my opinion. So I think we probably already covered this, but what would be the advantage of using this technique over just an array of strain gauges on a material? Well, yeah, the main advantage is it's, uh, you, th this actually happened recently. I can't give you the details, of course, but a colleague of mine had put a bunch of strain gauges on a particular area of an aircraft and it looked fine. Look, everything looked good. And, and, and then they put on a DIC pattern and lo and behold, in the region between the strain gauges, they never even thought about, they had large deformations. And, and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't try to extrapolate between one strain gauge over here and that one and get anything useful because you, don't have, no, you have no data there. So it, as long as you, it, it's smooth and, and, and not a lot of deformation going on there, it works fine to just try to extrapolate between them um, or interpolate, if you will, between them. Uh, but in regions like that, where behind the, the area, uh, there was no reinforcement and it suddenly began to warp and distort uh, massively. Um, those areas, if you don't have a full field method, you're going to miss it. So th that is the main advantage to it, in my opinion. Uh, it's also simpler to use, to be frank with you. Uh, you do have to have two cameras. You have to have a system, uh, which, which is some expense uh, associated with that. But the bottom line with strain gauges is, Every time you use them, you got to throw them away. Yeah. Not with this system. You can use it for 20 years. Well, and it's years. a contact measurement, whereas yours is contact free. You can't use it at all in, in soft materials. Uh, strain gauges just aren't used there, but DIC is used all the time in biological materials. Now, that's another area, by the way, I should have mentioned. In biomechanics, bioengineering, uh, DIC is now becoming a, a, a staple. They're using it for bone, soft tissue, heart tissue. Uh, aortas, things like that all the time. It, it surprised me how fast that happened. Yeah. Um, it, it really occurred quickly once uh, technology for computers, roughly 2000, as, as computer technology or roughly the, at the millennium, uh, the dawn of the new millennium, when, that, when it began to take off and really rise quickly to a level that everybody could use it and it wasn't that expensive, 
um, the medical community particularly began to say, oh, wait a minute, we want to use that because it's fast. They yeah. can get data quickly. Uh, well, let me ask. So this technique sort of relies on this differentiable pattern with features. Um, tell me about the process for applying this. Is it hard to do? Is it very technical? Is it idiot proof? Tell me about it. Well, the, it, no, it's not particularly hard. Uh, you do have to have, if you think of it, there, there's two words you have to remember, high contrast. The, the pattern, has, if you want best accuracy, whatever pattern you put on, the features have to have high contrast so you can find one and know that there's one nearby that has a change in contrast, you can pick up the edge of it. That allows you to, to accurately locate it as it moves. If you have edges in there that you can accurately locate because there's a sharp change, which the interpolation algorithms that Dr. Shire wrote do well, then he can find it very accurately. And, and that's, the, that's the heart of it, high contrast pattern. Black and white paint we use all the time. Gotcha. 99.9% you know, of the stuff a light coating of spray paint with white and then a, a dusting of uh, either a, a roller of a, a black pattern of a known size or uh, a spray uh, some sort of a stencil or a paint uh, to put on uh, the, the black dots works fine. Um, you, you, do, you do have to be aware of one thing. That is, if you have a large object, say five meters by five, or maybe a solar cell, like, in outer, like they have uh, for NASA, where they are using DIC technology, by the way, on solar sails in space to track the, the sail as it uh, balloons open and they can see how it's deforming. That pattern is very big because it's a huge object and they want to resolve those. If they're too small, you can't even see them. The pixel completely blurs it out. You don't even see a yeah, pattern. Gotcha. Gray. So you have to have the right size speckle for your pattern, the right size feature. So you can resolve it. So ideally it's, it would be what size relative to the pixel size? A tip, you want each feature to be at least three by three pixels. Okay. At least three by three to get accurate reconstruction during interpolation of the change between the light and the dark regions. Gotcha. If you do that, you can do five by five, seven by seven. That, that, that reduces your spatial resolution, of course, a little bit because you don't need very many dots to, to accurately uh, reconstruct an area. So uh, you, you, you can always oversample, but if you, if you go below two by two, it doesn't work well. Now you start losing the edges. You can't tell very, as it moves, it's hard to tell where the edge was because it was already only two pixels by two pixels in size. So it becomes harder to completely accurately reconstruct the original pattern. Therefore, when it moves, you can't really reconstruct it very well to match the other one because neither one of them are very good. Hmm. So three by three or larger works great. And do you run into any issues where the film or the paint and the speckle that you're applying is straining at a different rate or at a, in a different amount than the, the underlying material? And unfortunately we did over the years. Uh, I'm not a big fan <laughs> of putting on a film of any type. We've had some real problems at NASA you know, years ago. Um, if, if, if it doesn't bond well to the surface and if it's too stiff, relative to your underlying substrate, then you're going to have problems. Yeah, you measure the wrong thing. Measure the wrong thing. So I, I don't, I personally don't encourage that unless it's really necessary. If you really need to put it on because it's something that's very, very thin, it's easy to put on, you can be sure it bonds to the surface well and doesn't slip and doesn't change, it moves with the object, it's fine. But uh, there are too many cases I've seen where people have got all sorts of wonderful data that was absolutely useless. Yeah. Because it either slipped off, it either debonded, or it was too stiff. And the underlying substrate was trying to stretch and the film wouldn't let it. Yeah. All of those can cause problems with it. So I, we tend to use very thin coats of paint or just a dot pattern on a background that's already light. Uh, we use, by the way, use that for shingles recently. Uh, roofing shingles, asphalt roofing shingles. Um, it turns out that some shingles that are on roofs have white uh, granules on them with, a, with the asphalt black shingle underneath. That works great. So we can track how shingles deform in 150 mile an hour winds with DIC. Well, can I ask, you know, tell us a little bit about your company. We're about out of time, but I'd love to learn more about what your company specializes. Do you sell the product? Do you sell it as a service? Like, tell us about Correlated Solutions. Yeah, it, we, we don't do a lot of consult. We're not a consulting company. 
Uh, we let other people do that. Uh, we, we sell product. The products are, are Vic 2D, Vic 3, uh, two dimensional, one single camera, looking at flat surfaces that uh, deform in plane or translate in plane. Uh, Vic 3D, which is a stereo system, which is the standard today. 99% of our sales are in that area because it measures the full three dimensional shapes, whether it's curved or flat, doesn't matter. And it measures the three dimensional motions of it. Uh, we also used, uh, developed a VIC volume that is for CT scanning. There are uh, one of the fastest growing areas in Europe, particularly, is using synchrotron radiation uh, off a nuclear reactor, uh, which is very high, uh, very high energy particles to do CT scans of objects that have an internal pattern. And you track the whole internal volume deforming and you use the DIC concepts in three dimensions to track the internal and you get full volumetric uh, deformations and strains. Um, so we, we sell all three of those. We sell the hardware and the software that goes with those to build those systems. Uh, and that's basically what we do. We do do a, a little bit of, uh, I guess you would say support. Uh, if a company really needs to understand how to use it properly, uh, we may send somebody out there, we work with them to figure out how to do it. Uh, we may take a system out with us uh, to, to help them, but we don't really do full-time consulting gotcha. you know, for, for pay. We, we sell systems instead. Well, this is fascinating. It's got my you know mind wondering what the future holds. Do you think that the day will come when I can just get you know two iPhones and set them up a little ways apart and do simple demonstrations of strain measurements in an introductory lab or what? Well, you, you could. Uh, the, the main problem with cell phones right now is that, first of all, it's color. As you said earlier, you, you got to deal with all three colors. Uh, so you got to figure out how to do that because all three can be correlated. Uh -huh. You have to have a pattern that you can correlate with either combining the colors to get something or individual colors and then somehow averaging the results. That's one thing <clears throat> that's been worked on. So that's, that's doable. Uh, the other problem is the images themselves. A lot of the cameras, the cell phone cameras, unfortunately, they already process the image. Oh yeah. You guys know that. They yep. modify it. They got, if they got a bunch of pixels that don't work, they don't care. They just smooth out between the others. They, they interpolate before we get them <laughs> and we don't know what they did. And as a result, there are regions in there that are not useful at all. So what you need is a raw image. And that means you've got to get all the data, including the dead pixels, the ones that aren't there. And you got to have those in a stream that comes out. Okay. If you can do that. And you, you have the time to set up the cameras, the two, two you can do it today. Uh, a group in France uh, uh, at the Col de Ming uh, Polytechnic in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Cachon uh, did that about a decade ago. They actually did, Taylor, what you're talking about. They took two cell phone cameras and did exactly that. But they used the raw images and they had to modify them. They did them in color. They, they're the, or one of the early ones developing color with that. That's pretty phenomenal. And well, also should mention that we also have a, we're now working in the education system. Uh, we now sell education systems, very cost effective, low cost uh, stereo systems for, for labs. Uh, we're selling them in China, the US, uh, we sold a, you know, 50 to hundred already only came out this last year. So we're now pushing forward with that because that allows people to get in the lab and learn how to use it. Oh yeah. That's and fascinating. That'll help industries in the long term. And I know there's a couple of systems that do DIC, for example, here at the University of Utah, but they're all in somebody's laboratory, right? And you don't want to risk breaking it. But if it's a maybe a lower cost system, maybe it's not quite the same resolution. I don't know. But something that you oh, can put in a user facility, that's much more intriguing. Yeah, it's a, I think it's around a 2.4 megapixel camera. Yeah. It's not bad. It's a good one. And uh, it's stereo. It has two cameras in, in one box. And uh, the, the entire uh, box is what we sell. And it comes already pre-calibrated. So you don't have to calibrate it. It's already done. And if you want to recalibrate it, we can show you how to do it, or we, you can send it back and we can recalibrate it again if you're concerned about dropping it. You yeah, drop yeah. it a couple yeah. of times or something. Well, that's cool. Well, Dr. Sutton, thank you for joining us for this episode. This is fascinating. Anything else you want to say before you go? Anything else you want to tell us about? Well, I, I guess the only thing I, I, I would say is when you get on something like this, there's going to be times when people don't believe you. Uh, NASA didn't believe this was good when we did it in the, in the 90s with them. The university didn't think it was good when we did it in the 90s with NASA. And uh, you just have to stay on it. You have to, you have to understand the fundamentals and realize what you got. And to me, 
the motivation for doing things is curiosity and the desire to learn something plus the willingness to stick to it and get it done. And I think to me, that's the one lesson I've learned from all this is by staying on it, we're able to get all this done. We, we actually started the company because neither NASA nor the university wanted to deal with it. Uh, and we had a, a, a fellow at the Army Re uh, Air Force Research Lab, uh, Dr. Claire Paul, who said, I got to have this system in the 1997 timeframe. So we had to start a company to build the system because the university wouldn't do it uh, internally and send it to him. How cool. And, How cool to see, you know, 40 years or whatever has elapsed by to see this go from uh, a possible maybe idea that people don't have much faith into a tool that you can find at every, certainly every R1 university around the country. Yeah, yeah. and as we've seen countless times, it's usually the ideas that are, are initially rejected that often end up becoming really like transformational technologies, as we've seen throughout all our podcast episodes on the history of so many transformational materials. It I seems a, to be no different. I had a colleague of mine at, at Caltech University uh, told me, I, I, I asked him one day, when was the next one going to come? Where was the next shit, the, the next phase? When, when's the next invention going to come that's going to make DIC passe, move on? He looked at me, he said, not for 100 years. And I asked him, I looked at him and said, why do you say that? He said, because this is a general technology that use, utilizes computer computational yeah. um, developments. He said, that's going to continue to grow and expand, and so is the technology with it. I just looked at him and go, okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. Very cool. Okay, Dr. Sutton, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, anything else, you, you can get a hold of me anytime. Look forward to talking to you anytime in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Today's episode was sponsored by Correlated Solutions. If if you have time, even just a few minutes, I highly recommend going to their website. I've had to do quite a lot of equipment procurement in my days where you go to the company, you try to look and you want to buy some piece of equipment, and they have pretty much no information on their, their product. They want to get it into your hands with as little questions as possible. And so if it's something you're not that familiar with, you're kind of left wondering. You don't really know what you're buying. Correlated Solutions, on the other hand, you go to their website, they have all sorts of videos explaining the technique, explaining what you can do with it, what's what this technique is even capable of, so that you go in there as an educated buyer and can make the right decision. Uh, after listening to this podcast, you should be an educated buyer on it, but it, it's a really great you know, website that actually sells a product and is honest about how great the product they're selling is and wants you to know how great it is too. But we don't want to forget any of the other people who make this show possible. Materials Today has a great article going over and giving a nice overview of digital image correlation. There's some nice citations in there too. So if you want to go even further and see what's happening in this field and what's the, the cutting edge research, definitely check out this great Materials Today article titled Digital Image Correlation by Nick McCormick and Jerry Lord in 2010. Okay, thanks for listening to this episode. As always, we love that you're there for us. We appreciate the suggestions for new episodes. If you are interested in sponsoring an episode, reach out to us. We could probably put something together. We think that'd be super rad. Obviously, huge thanks to the music for this episode. We love the people, Colobi, Alphabot. We love what you do, rad music. As always, if you want to connect with us, the best way to do that, find us on the Material subreddit. Find us on Instagram at, at materialism.podcast. Shoot us an email, materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.